Well, good evening, everyone. It is my honor as your proud Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services to welcome you all this evening to our fifth annual Women in Industry event. It is exciting for me to look out into this audience and see seats that are filled with such a diverse group. I see students, staff members, family, and friends all here tonight for the same reason, to support and encourage our incredible students. Events such as these don't happen without the hard work of a team of highly dedicated people. So I'd like to say a few special words of thanks and recognize the following five individuals for their leadership in planning for tonight. Mrs. Gina Aguilar. <laughs> Mrs. Beth Scott. <laughs> Mrs. Brianne Galotti. Mrs. Amy Madrigal, and Mrs. Sue Sawyer. We are grateful to each of you for your involvement and for making tonight possible. When I consider the title of tonight's event, what stands out to me most is the word empowered. It serves as a reminder to me and really to all of us of the power each one of us possesses to do great things with our lives. And you'll be hearing from several speakers this evening who have figured out just that. Empowered women who are not only thinkers and activators, but who'll be sharing their stories of resilience and how they discovered firsthand the power within to thrive, to lift others up, and overcome obstacles. The second part of tonight's title, Women in Leadership, makes me think of my own journey and how far we've all come. Growing up as a young girl in South Africa, high school subjects like math and science were required for boys, but optional for girls. What was not explained to us early on, however, was that math and science were subjects that were needed and required for most university applications and several degrees, including law, medicine, engineering, and business. Needless to say, growing up, I had very few female role models in these positions, which made it hard to imagine myself in any one of these career options. I'm grateful to my father, who refused to allow me and my two sisters to even entertain the idea for a second of not taking math. Needless to say, we took math. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate him and how much I appreciated him when the time came for me to make my decisions about my future career and university choices. We live in a much different world today, I'm proud to say. But it is events like tonight that remind us of the many possibilities that remain open to each of us, each of you students here this evening, regardless of your gender. I hope that the stories you hear tonight will inspire you and remind you that anything is possible because you are the creators of your own future. It was Dr. Seuss who said, you never know how profound a moment is until it becomes a memory. So it's my hope that everything you learn here tonight will live on in each of your memories and continue to lift and build you up, keeping hope alive many years from today. And now, prepare to be inspired and empowered. Good evening. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. My name is Beth Scott, and it is my honor to welcome you to the fifth annual Empowered Forum for Women in Industry. I want to thank Esperanza High School's Air Force JROTC program for the color guard detail, and I want to acknowledge and thank our students presenting the colors this evening. Valerie Sanchez, Andrea Martinez, Sophia Halverson, Sarah Vejar. I hope you all have an opportunity to register your attendance here tonight, which automatically enters you in the Chromebook drawing. 
thanks to the generosity of Laura, Laura Head from USA Softball of Southern California, we are giving away two Chromebooks at the end of the night, but you must be present to win. If you have not registered, but would like to enter your name for our Chromebook drawing, you can still register using the QR code in your program. We are honored to welcome our PYLUSD school board members, all of whom are incredibly supportive of our CareerLink Academies and CTE Pathways. Honored members, please stand as I say your name. And audience, please hold your applause until the last name is called. President Carrie Buck. Vice President Marilyn Anderson. Trustee Karen Freeman. In addition, I'm pleased to recognize the Placentia Yorba Linda Unified School District Executive Management Team. Assistant Superintendent of Educational Services, Dr. Linda Adamson. Assistant Superintendent of, Assist of Executive Services, Richard McAlinden. Director of Communications, Alyssa Griffith. And from our cabinet, we would like to thank the following directors. Executive Director of Special Education, Renee Gray. Director of Elementary, Dr. Liz Leone. G Director of High Schools, Gina Aguilar. Human Resources, Nancy Blade. Nutrition Services, Suzanne Morales. Dean, uh, Director of Student Support and Ach Achievement, Dr. Shelley Spessard. And last, but certainly not least, Christina Michelle from Business. <laughs> Lastly, Lastly, if we have any panelists or past keynote speakers in our audience, please stand. We would like to recognize you here this evening. Let me see you. There she is. I knew you were out there. And we now welcome El Dorado High School's very own assistant principal, Mrs. Amy Madrigal, to the stage. Good evening. Career technical education programs help students find their voice, their passion, and excellence in all they do. For the students in the PYLUSD, it becomes mission possible as they navigate rigorous academic and technical content to feed their passion, lean into struggle, and take ownership of their own education. In this way, each student makes a positive impact on their future. Students who graduate from our CTE programs become engineers, nurses, chefs, journeymen, IT specialists, screenplay writers, filmmakers, esteemed members of the military, and Emmy Award winners. The students selected as moderators this evening have found their passion in a wide variety of our CTE programs, and we are honored to work with amazing, fearless young leaders. I have the pleasure of introducing these 10 amazing young women. I am truly moved by their exceptional confidence. We have a powerful group. Please stand as I call your name. Jada Aguilar, El Camino High School, designed for digital print. Lucy Cavaluzzi, El Dorado High School, ED Law. Hunena Herji, Yorba Linda High School, Business. Abigail Hewn, Yorba Linda High School, Culinary. Isha Jawar, Esperanza High School, Medical Academy. Sarah Lee, Valencia High School, El Tigre Publications. Grace May, El Dorado High School, Photography. Layla Malaku, Valencia High School, Production and Managerial Arts. Luna Olguin, El Camino High School, Design for Digital Print. And Allison Seip, Esperanza High School, Digital Design. Now I would like to invite Lucy Cavaluzzi to the stage. Lucy Cavaluzzi is a member of ED Law at El Dorado High School.
Good evening, everyone. It's my privilege tonight to introduce this year's Women in Industry keynote speaker, Coach Kelly Inouye Perez. Coach Kelly, who lives in Cerritos with her husband, Gerardo, is beginning her 16th season as the UCLA softball program's head coach and has contributed to five decades of Bruin softball success, serving previously as an exceptionally strong catcher and a dedicated and excellent assistant coach. She's an eight-time national champion whose .788 winning percentage ranks fifth amongst active head coaches in NCAA Division I softball. In 2019, Coach Inouye Perez guided the Bruins in their 13th national championship and 12th NCAA title. During that season, the Bruins showcased their perseverance and resilience in 14 comeback victories. Coach Kelly won her 600th career game in a title-clinching victory over Oklahoma. And she and her staff were named the 2019 NFCA National Coaching Staff of the Year for the second time, and the NFCA Regional Coaching Staff of the Year for the fifth time. Over the course of her career, Coach Inouye Perez has developed four Bruin Olympians, two Honda Sport Award winners, and 37 NFCA All-American selections. In addition, nearly every UCLA pitching record has been set during her time overseeing the Bruin Battery, and she has coached the top five pitchers in UCLA career, win career wins list. In an incredibly well-deserved reflection of her wonderful career, Coach Kelly will be inducted into the UCLA Hall of Fame this Friday. Since I'm the Eldorado baseball announcer, I wanted to invite her up in my favorite way. Now speaking, number two, Coach Kelly Inouye Perez. I love it. talk about some of the mentors in my life? Thank you, Lucy. Wow. Can you please give it up for that voice right there, Lucy? Life, give it up. But, uh, give it up. Most recently, throughout my UCLA career, Coach Sharon Backus, who was the first coach okay. of UCLA. First and foremost, UCLA I want to be able to say um, what an honor. Oh, wow. We got to do a little video first. Sorry, Sue. Okay, with that being said, first and foremost, I just want to be able to say thank you and what an honor it is to be here with all of you tonight. I think for, I wanted to also give you a little bit of background that, I, yes, I've been at UCLA as a student athlete, as an assistant coach and a head coach for going into my 33rd year. Kind of crazy for a long time. And it's funny because Sue Sawyer here, um, I'm on the coaching end and the umpires that are on the field, not, you wouldn't necessarily say coaches and umpires are best friends, right? <laughs> Not necessarily, but I think the best umpires are respected. The best umpires are professional. And when you have, any time we play the game, our, when we see a female umpire out there, we celebrate. And Sue was exactly that. She was a professional, she was respected, and she made it to the highest level on the College World, World Series stage. And I want to take a moment to be able to say thank you for bringing me here tonight to be a part of something that I think is truly special opportunity for all of us. So if you give me, Give it up for me, please, and say thank you to Sue Sawyer. So we had an opportunity to chat a little bit about what tonight was going to be about. And one of the first things that I'd love to be able to say is the word empowered. I love that word. The ability to make people more confident and stronger and taking control of their lives. So I'm here tonight just to share a couple things on what I do because I feel like I have the greatest job in the world. You could sit here and say, you went to UCLA and you're a softball coach? I didn't go to UCLA just to be a softball coach, but I went to UCLA to surround myself with some pretty amazing people. And now I have the opportunity to bleed into my athletes, females, and I wanted to be able to share that that word empowered is a part of our mission statement. Our mission statement, the purpose of why we're here, for me as a coach for UCLA softball, is we empower our student athletes to be leaders in life. We guide them through mentoring and modeling to be powerful females that are going to kick butt in the real world. It says that in our handbook. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but yeah, so with it, the word empowered is something in there that is very true to me. Nowhere in there does it say it's all about winning a national championship. But please believe, we are all about getting after natties every year. That's our goal, right? But I think the bigger picture is my job is to empower our student athletes as females through the lessons learned 
both on the field, in the classroom, and in the real world to get ready to be able to figure out what they're going to do to continue to be leaders beyond their playing field. So I'm excited about tonight to be able to just share some thoughts and some of the things that I like to talk about, okay? But before I get started, I wanted to ask. So I have a, lot, a big audience here, and I wanted to get a little feel. So can I, ha can I see a hand of all the high school students that are in the house tonight? Can you raise your hand? Oh, I love that. Yeah, go ahead and give it up. I want to know if there's any JC or college students that are in the house tonight. Any, any JCs that are looking? No? Okay, okay. Thank you. I love that you're here. How about, are there any younger, any junior high, middle school students that are here? Oh, yeah. Let's give it up for them. And you're all still under the, the, the roof of your parents. So can I see all the parents that are in the house tonight? Raise your hands. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. We'll give it up for the parents. I think a big part of this is being able to reach all of you. So for you parents, thank you for being able to be here tonight and to bring your kids, but also to be able to learn about opportunities that you have for your kids. For you younger ones, I love it. And I'm going to get to a big part of how important it is to surround yourself with people that are just like you, ready to figure out what you're going to do to, make, to leave your mark in this world. So I'm going to share a couple things about UCLA. First and foremost, how I communicate about everything is always three things. Always be true and real with where we are now. So where are you right now? And everyone's in a different place in this room. Trying to figure out where you're going to go is an important part. Always being clear about where you want to go. So I could say, some of you just say, oh, I want to make a lot of money. How many people that want to make a lot of money? Raise your hand. I hope all of you, right? <laughs> your goal is to make more than your parents, so get to work, right? <laughs> so understanding where you are now, where you want to go, have a vision, but how you do it is the most important part. And I communicate this to our girls all the time. So right now you may say, yeah, I'm, I'm a middle schooler, I'm a high schooler, where I want to go is I want to make a lot of money, but I really have no clue how I'm going to do that. And that's all of us, we go through this journey. So being able to get clear about the how, I think is a big part of what tonight is all about. You're going to hear stories, you're going to hear ideas, you're going to hear successes, you're going to hear failures. Nobody's really clear about what tomorrow will bring, but being able to always keep your eye on what it is. So I can ask, is anybody here, is anybody here like numbers? Any of you high schoolers, do you like numbers? Do you like math? Raise your hand. Yeah, but if I said, if you had to count dollar bills, would you like numbers? Yes or no? <laughs> so numbers could be kind of important, right? How many of you guys like to build? Does anyone in here like to build? Yeah, but when you talk about living in that big time three-story house, it'd be nice that somebody really had attention to detail on how to build, right? Or how many people like to walk in the house and turn on a switch and have the electricity go on? Yeah, anybody? That's all of us? You better hope that somebody has the skill to make sure that that works if that breaks, right? So there's people that have passions. I'm going to ask this. How many people love art? Does anybody love art, right? It decorates and colors the entire world. So everybody has skills. Oh, I got to ask this. Are there any athletes in the house? Right? Okay, awesome. Yep, and there is a place for all of you to be able to be on a stage to showcase what you want, but you got to remember there's always life beyond that. So there's, there's, it's a very important part. I always talk to our girls about being clear about, being really clear about what you're good at, being able to be clear about what the world may need, and then hopefully what you're passionate about. And if you're really, really fortunate, you get to be able to find out what you're good at, the world may need it, and if you're passionate about it, you hit the jackpot. But I'm also going to be on the reel, and you're going to hear from a lot of us tonight. We may have not been able to have that path to just figure out exactly what we wanted, be passionate, and the world needed it. Because sometimes you just got to pay the bills. So you may have to find a profession that you're going to have to have success and pay bills, and then save the money to be able to find out what it is that you're going to be passionate about. That's what you get to do as you go through different phases of your life. And that's the best thing about it, is it's your life. Empowering is gaining confidence being able to have more control over your life. And that's what we want to do tonight. So you want to really empower all of you. Okay, so be clear. Where you are now, doesn't matter how old you are. Where you're going, you're going to figure that out. And I hope you take a lot of different paths because then you're going to learn more about what it is that you're passionate about. Okay, but the how we're going to do it, you got to get crystal clear about how you're going to be able to get after what it is that's going to allow you to be successful. Okay, and then 
Another thing that I like to talk about is then you've got to really get clear as you start taking off on this journey. I have no idea where I'm going to go, but I'm going to try this, I'm going to try that. The program that you're getting offered here is allowing you the opportunity to be able to try different things. You may like it, you may not like it, you may succeed, you may fail. Let me just tell you this, as a softball coach, this is how I manage my student athletes. Your ability to understand that you will succeed and you will fail, that is a fact. I'm gonna ask this to the parents right now. Have you ever experienced failure parents? Raise your hand. Even though they, the, the words that they speak always seem like they never failed, right? Because they always know, right? <laughs> they, they know everything. They always say, you should have done this, you could have done this. That's, what, that's a parent's job. But it's through their experiences that they know it all. And their job is to be able to help you along the way. But ultimately, the most important thing is we all fail in life. For us, as softball players, especially at UCLA, the winningest program in the history of our sport, the expectations are high. The standards are high. We're on TV. There are people that are watching all the time. And they don't just watch for us to be able to see how we perform in our sport. TV likes to hone in right after somebody fails to be able to look right at your face because that's what TV likes. Ooh, let's see how she managed the fact she just struck out with bases loaded. Or let's look at the pitcher after she just gave up a home run with 8,000 people in the stands watching right? So my job is to make sure that they understand how we manage success and failure. It's very easy to talk about how you manage success. We know how to circle at the plate after a home run trot and give high fives. That's easy. I don't have to teach people that. But I do have to be able to get to how we manage failure. And this is how we do it. So for us, failure, we don't fear failure. Failure is an opportunity. So if I told you that it, in those moments where you may have failed, I, it, for us, it's in sport. We may have struck out, okay? If I told you that wasn't a failure moment, that was a moment for you to be able to show everybody what you're made of right after that failure. So the defining moment is not failing, striking out with bases loaded. That's a bummer. But being able to see how you manage that is where you're going to gain respect. So what you do next is the most important part. And our mindset is we don't fear failure. We look at it. We flip it. It is an opportunity to show everybody just what you're made of. Whether you, de you do poorly, has anyone done poorly on a, on, a, on a high school test? Raise your hand. Right? Has anybody, right? Has anybody ever, I'm just going to say this, not done a chore and may have been disciplined for a chore at home? Hello? Okay? There are things that we do, but how you choose to respond is your defining moment. Not the fact that you didn't get a good grade, that you didn't study enough, that you, did, you weren't responsible to do your job, but what you do next is your defining moment. And your ability to take accountability for it is when you truly start owning yourself. So for us, I don't get to just the words. So if you fail, just be happy. Have a smile face. Have, you know, I'm not saying that. But I will say this. We get to what it looks like when you do fail what you should look like. So I'm going I'm to ask all of you this. If you want to be successful, then failure is not going to derail you. It is going to actually lift you up to make you work a little harder. But you have to get over that hard part first of failure, possibly getting disciplined, yelled at, whatever the, word, whatever the situation may be. So I'm going to say there's three things that I have our girls do after failure besides just have a good attitude, right? I actually say your body language is going to be a big part of letting people know that you manage the situation and you're moving forward and give me another. So I'm gonna ask all of you in this room right now, I'm gonna ask all of you to sit up, sit up. Yep, everybody in the back, everybody in the back, sit up, let me see you, oh, look it, not stand up, sit up. Thank you though, I appreciate you. <laughs> sit up, body language, okay? So after failure, what if you actually shoulders back, chin up, instead of now I wanna see everybody round out their shoulders and look down. Don't look at your phones right now, which I know you want to do, okay? <laughs> look down. Okay, so if I look at the audience right here, not engaged, not really dialed in, body language is bad. Now I'm going to say it one more time. Everyone sit up, sit up, look up, shoulders back, chin up. Okay, do you feel the difference between looking down and sitting up? Do you have control of that, yes or no? Yes. I'm going to ask you, do you have control over that, yes or no? Yes. So your ability to respond to failure with shoulders back, chin up is basically showing people, yep, Give me another. I may have failed, but give me another because I'm ready for the next. Being able to be caught in the moment, oh, it's not my fault, it's not fair, this, that, like that frustration, it's simply because you just don't know how to manage the situation. 
So my job is to teach them really quickly. When we fail, this is what we do. Shoulders back, chin up. That's one part. Facial expression is another. One of the most difficult things to do, especially in this generation, and I'll be honest with you guys, because you are iPhone generation, is to be able to look up and have eye contact with people. It's almost awkward. Like if you look at somebody, that's awkward. Why are you looking at me, right? <laughs> but your ability to understand, if I could stand up and actually look someone in the eyes, that's something that even adults, it's difficult for everyone to do. But if you want to be empowered to be able to be in control and be stronger and more confident in you, then failure is not going to, is not going to bring you down. So you shoulders back, look up, and you have eye contact with somebody, yep, I may have failed, but give me another opportunity, changes the whole dynamic. How many of you in this room, I'm talking to you high schoolers and middle schoolers, have ever seen someone roll their eyes? Okay, how many of you, I asked if you saw anyone roll your eyes, how many of you have actually ever rolled your eyes? Thank you for being honest, I appreciate that, okay? Do you have control over that? Yes. Oh wait, I didn't hear you. Do you have control over that? Yes. So what if the next time you were frustrated, the next time you failed, you actually looked up, shoulders back, and looked someone right back in the eye? That that didn't defeat me. I'm not mad. I'm not saying it's not fair. I'm actually saying, yep, it happened. Now what? Okay, your ability to have the basic respect of being able to look fear, failure in the eyes and be able to show that it doesn't break me down. Yep, I'm ready for another. It might have been bad. It straight up might have, excuse my words, sucked. But your ability to respond to it is your defining moment. When something happens and goes wrong, how you respond is your defining moment. So fa failure is not a bad thing. It is an opportunity to be able to show what you're truly made of. If you have the ability to shoulders back, chin up, look it straight in the eyes, and then the last part is your tone. Has anybody ever been, okay, I'm going to ask this, and it's going to sound silly. Does anyone ever heard a bad tone before? Someone yell or kind of a little frustrated? Yes or no? Yes? And it's tough when you hear words from somebody who's yelling with a strong voice, negative voice, demeaning voice, all of those things, or somebody yells back. I'm going to ask another question. Have you ever gone to somebody and said, it's okay, and they give you the shoulder shrug, like, leave me alone, don't touch me, don't talk to me? Has anyone ever seen that? That's a bummer, right? So I'm going to say, control of your body language, control of your facial expression, control of your tone, as frustrated as you are, and this may take time. I still have to work on this constantly. But when given the opportunity to be able to show body language, facial expression, tone, I'm on TV all the time, and I get interviewed after a really critical bad moment. Here comes Holly Rowe, and she look, <laughs> looks right at me, and it's like, Kelly, I'm so sorry. And I'm like, just go, you know? And, and I have to take a deep breath, <laughs> ask a stupid question, here we go, right? <laughs> so then she's like, you know, we always talk a little bit before the camera starts, and we blah, 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 blah. What are you gonna say? What are you gonna ask? Just be prepared, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Hi, it's Holly Rowe. <laughs> and I have to literally go, right? But it's an opportunity right there and then to show my players, to show the fans, to show the opponent that there is no way that you're getting to me. So body language, facial expression, I do have to manage my tone, I will own that, but I think it's a big part of how you create those opportunities to manage big, big situations. Does everyone get that? So what's the first thing that you could be in control after failure? Second thing? And the last thing? So the next time something goes wrong, you get in trouble, you get a bad grade, you don't get what you want. You fear the opportunity. I want you to look it straight in the eyes, shoulders back, chin up, and say, bring it on. When you actually empower yourself to not fear failure, sky's the limit, because nothing will get in your way. Nothing will be too hard. And I always tell the girls, the harder the path, the greater the reward. So there's always an easier path. And if you choose to take that in life, you wouldn't be here tonight, okay? So that's, that's something that I want to talk about. So I talk about being able to understand the last part is being able to say how important it is to be able to surround yourself. One of, one of the coach I mantras is the key to success is to surround yourself with people that are just as committed and passionate as you are. So I'm gonna say right now, this group right here is what I call top third. You're all here to be able to figure out what I wanna do with my life because I wanna be successful and I may have no clue, but I'm gonna start today. That is top third. So I'm gonna ask all of you to stand up right now. Everyone stand up. Yep, you're not gonna just sit here and listen to this person talk. 
And I want you to high five the person to the left and the right because you're here tonight as top third. That's right. Give it up because a big part of success is to surround yourself with people that are just like you. Okay, now everyone sit down. So there are three types of people in this world. There's the top third people that are getting after it. They want to be successful in life. They bleed energy. They bleed excitement. They want to be able to find out what's next. That's top third people. Then there's middle third people. Yes, they want the same, and they want to be able to get after it, but they're easily influenced by the group. Are you doing it? Are you going to go? If, if, wait, if she's going to go and he's going to go, then maybe I'll go. There's nothing wrong with that, but your ability to separate and just be a top third person is difficult. But middle third people, they're still in. They may just need to find out who's going, okay? But then the most important thing is you have to know who the bottom third people are. And the bottom third people in your life are the ones that are saying, why? Why would I go to this thing tonight? There's something really good on Netflix that I'd rather be watching. Why are you studying extra to be able to, figure, to do that when we're all going out tonight? Why are you focused on the future? You're just in middle school. Are you kidding me? There's people that will literally suck the life out of you because they're negative. They may not have the vision to be able to understand where they're going to go in the future, and they may doubt and actually pull you down. Does anybody know in, in, anyone in this world that may be neck bottom third? Raise your hand if you do. We all do. And people will go through that. The key is separate yourself from the bottom third. You may not live in top third your whole life. Middle third happens, but do not associate with those bottom third. Those are people that are saying you will never be a doctor. Really? You're not smart enough. You will never be able to be a lawyer. You're not able to to, to talk enough. You may never be an engineer. You may never be able to make it in the Marines. You'll get kicked out. You'll, you'll never be able to be a leader. You'll never be able to go to college. You'll never be able to start a profession, make a lot of money because they have no idea. So separate yourself from those people. So the key is to surround yourself with people that are just as committed and passionate as you are. And that to me is the biggest part of the key to success. So I'm going to simply say, are you all ready to hear some stories for some really powerful females that have great stories of sacrifice, their ability to be resilient, their ability to be motivated, and we all have failed at some point? Are you ready to be able to hear from some powerful females? Yes? Yeah. So I'll, I'll end with this. The most important part of everyone's journey is being true to yourself. You don't have to worry about what anybody else tells you you can or cannot do, but being true to yourself. So what we say at UCLA, all my athletes are, are diamonds in the rough. That means they, they possess a talent. They're leaders already. They have a skill. But does anyone know how a diamond is made from that piece of coal? Does anyone know? Right? Pressure. Extreme heat and pressure. And the hardest path that you take is going to be able to allow you to become the best version of yourself. Okay, and that to me is a big part of what the success of our program is, is knowing that it's in there already. You don't have to go to school to be able to become, a, to be able to be that. You already have it. It's how you're choosing to unlock it. And, and actually, I take it back. I skipped something. Before I go to my powerful females, I skipped my Lucy question. Probably one of the biggest parts of this and what I should have started with is as females, one of the biggest things that I tell my athletes always is, I have a term, I have a mantra. It's called to, op to be, always operate within your strength zone, but outside of your comfort zone. So I ask this. I ask, I ask if, does anybody know, or tell me what that means to you, Lucy. When I say, operate within your strength zone, but outside your comfort zone, I want to be able to know what that means to you. Go ahead, Lucy, what do you think? And I want you guys to be thinking about that. What do you think that means to you? Um, so I was going to talk about an example. Um, for me, I know I'm generally better at performing and public speaking, but sometimes getting in front of crowds is, ner is nerve-wracking. So putting myself into a performance or going out and doing um, plays yep. and musicals is a way of putting myself in a place where I may be a little uncomfortable, but where I know that I can rely on the skills that I have. One, 100, does, does everyone, did everyone hear that? Please give it up for Lucy. I'm just going to throw it out there and ask if anyone wants to be able to share what they, that's perfect. Does anybody else 
think they understand what that means? I'm, gonna, I'm looking to high schoolers. Is anyone brave enough to be able to stand up? And what do you think operate? Oh, you got fingers pointing to, yeah, stand up. Stand up. Oh, I love this. I love this. For, what's, your, what's your name? Haley. Haley. First of all, I know you got kind of picked, which I love, but I love that you stood up anyways when called out. So credit to you for being a strong female. Now, if I were to ask you, you said Haley, right? Yes. Haley, if I were to say, operate within your strength zone, Haley, but outside your comfort zone, what do you think that means? Oh. I absolutely. First of all, Haley, I can't wait to talk to you after this. Everyone, give it up for Haley. <laughs> Haley, what year in school are you? What year in school are you? I'm a senior. Oh wow. Okay, we'll talk later. Okay, on that. Um, so absolutely, you hear how she said something that she's more comfortable in, right, and good at, but outside? So I'm going to simply say this. Operate within your strength zone, and saying this especially to females. Know what you're good at. Know what you're good at, and be able to understand that's your strength. Okay? Be able to be clear about that, because we always cr criticize ourselves. Okay? We have the ability to say, oh, I need to be better at this. I need to look better than this. I need to do these things. But outside of your comfort zone means you may need to try something new. And I think a big part of this program is being able to find out what you possibly could do that could be outside your comfort zone, knowing you may be good in math, you may have to go and try something new, and that may be outside your comfort zone. Okay, on that, please give it up one more time for all of us being here tonight. Actually, let me grab my phone. And let's hear females. Thank you. Thank you, Coach. At this time, we would like to invite all of our panelists to the stage. All right, ladies, we would like to start by asking each member of the panel to introduce themselves and provide a brief overview of your occupation. Ms. Caponera, please begin with your introduction. Should I use this? Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm Cindy Caponera. I'm a writer, performer, um, producer, primarily a television comedy writer. I've been doing it since 1995, uh, before there were street lights. I don't know. Um, <laughs> and uh, something else. I've pretty much worked for every network. I've developed. I've written dramas and comedies and started at Second City and worked at Saturday Night Live. And that was the beginning of my career. And um, how long? OK, I was late. So I'm going to go. Thanks. Great job, Cindy. Good evening. I'm Giselle Wynn. I'm putting my shoulders up, chin up. And I am the co-founder of the Life Ops Learning Labs, which is a student-led uh, state curriculum driven uh, engaging learning lab experience to help empower students to communicate with confidence. We focus on four foundational skills, uh, which I may get into later on, but for 20 years of my career, I worked in corporate America for companies like the Coca Cola Company, where I spent 16 years. I also worked for Colgate Palmolive and Trigon Global or Yum Brands, which owns Pizza Hut, KFC, and Taco Bell. And after working in various 
different positions, I was able to pull together key skills to form my company. And in addition to that, I also work with nonprofits, two nonprofits. One is the Reach Foundation, which provides uh, STEM programs uh, for the district, and Inside the Outdoors Foundation, which is an environmental, environmental education organization that is administered by Orange County Department of Education. Hi, my name is Kelsey Kleino. Uh, I am a mechanical engineer and have been for six years now. I graduated from Cal Poly Pomona in 2016 with my degree and worked in aerospace for three years doing camera and sensor infrastructure for cameras that go on satellites, space, ground vehicles, all that fun stuff. Um, and in the last two or three years have been in the medical device industry working on hospital and at-home care monitoring devices, so, yeah. Uh, my name is Beth Nunn. I am the operating officer, chief operating officer for a very large medical group here in Fullerton, in Mission Viejo, High Desert, and um, we do probably about 7,000 visits a day. I have 630 physicians, about 4,000 employees, and I manage a $6 million budget. You already heard from me. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. My name is Asha Bhattacharya. I graduated from Esperanza in 2017, so for all the Esperanza students. Um, after graduation, I went to college, uh, graduated in May of 2021, and now I'm an area manager for Amazon Logistics. It's really fun. Basically, the, pa uh, the packages that get to your door, I manage that process and the logistics of how it gets to your door and if you get it on time. So if you don't get your packages on time, come talk to me. I'll straighten everything out. Um, I'm also very passionate about mental health and wellness. I've been volunteering with the National Alliance on Mental Illness since I was 16 years old. I give speeches to students across Orange County about suicide prevention and about the importance of really owning and honoring your own mental health and wellness. Uh, most recently at my university in Cal State Fullerton, we just opened up the university's first wellness room, which is focused on giving students a space to prioritize their mental health and prioritize their self-care. Hi, I'm Ruchi Acharya. I'm originally from India and um, I'm a physical therapist by profession and working at LAC USC. And um, I started my career as a physical therapist uh, in 2010. And that's when I think it struck, it struck me that I need to study a little bit more. And that's when I applied for universities in US and got through Loma Linda University and graduated from Loma Linda with my doctorate in 2016. And since then, I've never been happier. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Bonnie Saunders. Um, I am in the banking industry, started about 25 years ago. Um, and a lot of times when people think banking, they think retail banking when you go into the branch and you know visit your local teller or branch manager. Um, I started in the retail space, uh, but then about 10 years ago moved into treasury management. And I lead the um, sales support region uh, for the Western and Central region for treasury management, which basically means my folks sell products to customers that are businesses. So you think large corporations like Amazon or Trader Joe's, uh, they all have to have someone to bank with. Um, so my team um, offers them a suite of products that they are able to um, use to manage their everyday business. Hi, I'm Michelle Granger, and I went to Valencia High School back in the day. So from right around. It's a little weird for me to be at El Dorado, I'm not going to lie. Um, wasn't, wasn't my favorite place <laughs> when we were in high school. Anyway, um, so I caught the coaching bug pretty early on. I was at a world championship when I was like 14, I think, and 
the Chinese pitcher knocked on my door with an interpreter and said, how do you throw the rise ball? I'm like, oh, well, let me show you. That was smart. Um, so went down, had a little lesson, and she beat us with the rise ball the next day. I was a little proud. Um, but I've been coaching most of my life, and then um, after having four kids and kind of doing that, and um, I decided to go to pastry school, and I opened my own little business. I have a couple acres, and I grow my own produce, and then I decide what I'm going to make. So I have some really great <laughs> customers that pretty much tell me how many people are coming and what kind of stuff they need, and then I create it and put it out there, and it's it's been a lot of fun. And then I went back into college coaching, and then now I'm private coaching again. So I'm kind of combining my love for working with um, athletes and then still doing the baking business um, as well. Thank you, ladies. All right, each student has questions that will alternate between panelists. In addition, I may occasionally ask clarifying questions or expand the conversation. Our speed rounds allow each panelist to quickly, in a few words or one sentence or less, respond to a question. Jada Aguilar will start us out with our first speed round question. Ms. Cabanera, when you were a child, what did you want to be when you grew up? I think I always wanted to be an actress, and I wound up, um, uh, I, I, I'm panicked about how much time I have to answer things, but I will just say, um, I came from a very colorful family. There was a lot of singing and drinking, sorry. And um, so in high school, I was doing a lot of plays, and then in college, I tried uh, to do that, but, um, uh, what I did was I wound up leaving college to study at Second City. And then once I learned improvisation, that was when I felt like I found my sweet spot. And so um, I always performed and I always wrote for myself. And um, I just assumed uh, when I moved to New York from Chicago, I just assumed I was going to be acting. Um, I remember I was older, probably like 30, and I went to Juilliard. I'm like, can I come here? And they're like, lady, you're a little too old to come to Juilliard. I'm like, oh. So what happened was I was writing and performing, writing and performing, and I wound up at SNL, and then I kind of had to make a choice then to, um, because I had to learn how to write for other people, and there, there was a big margin of error, or what do they call it? Learning curve, not margin of error. Uh, so then I kind of put that on the back burner and went in this other direction. And um, it was more lucrative as a woman at the time to be writing as opposed to trying to be an actress. Um, so, yeah, that's what, that's my answer. All right. That's, that's my answer. answer. <laughs> so similar to Cindy, I also came from a colorful family, even though we didn't do a lot of drinking, which maybe we... I have seven brothers and sisters, and I'm the youngest of seven. So if you could imagine Asian girl, youngest, I had a lot of therapy that I had to go through. <laughs> but I always wanted to be a police officer, mainly because they were in the action. There was always something going on where you could help people, where you could get involved and solve problems. And I think I probably watched too much Charlie's Angels growing up. So when I was younger, I've been all over the place with what I want to do. Uh, but I think the one that stuck with me the most when I was little was a marine biologist. I just loved dolphins in the beach growing up. So naturally, that's where it took me. Um, and I had an uncle that told me, you're either going to do that and study dolphins and whales and all the things, or you're going to end up studying the habits of a sea cucumber. And I was like, oh, that's not really <laughs> what I'm going for. So that made me look other directions, which kind of led me to engineering in a weird way. And he's actually a mechanical engineer. So here we are. <laughs> so my answer is short and sweet. I wanted to be a psychologist. And I'm glad I'm not. 
Following that, I wanted to be a sports psychologist, and I think I'm actually doing that every day as a coach. <laughs> Love what I do. A little crazy. I also wanted to be a psychologist. <laughs> and um, I, I really, really wanted to be one, actually. And I struggled a lot in college trying to figure out what I wanted to major in. So my advice to all of you seniors in the room tonight is don't worry if you don't know exactly what you want to do because you are 18 years old. You're going to figure it out. Um, and if you end up doing something that's not what you might be totally passionate about, just like what she was saying, um, there are ways to fit it in and there are ways to incorporate that into your life. But I really wanted to be a therapist, figured out that is just a lot of emotions to deal with and I just need to focus on my own. Um, yeah, so that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to be an army officer like my dad, always, always, and I think if still I was given a chance, I would do that in a heartbeat. Uh, mainly because I think uh, I saw him, uh, how much pride, how much respect he received, and how he used to help people in our country. And I think that's, that's my major goal. Even now, I think being a physical therapist, uh, I think I'm, I'm fulfilling the same uh, goal that I am helping people, and I think I'm happy about it. Thank you. <laughs> um, at, at the age eight of like eight or nine, I wanted to be a water ballerina. I practiced routines in my <laughs> grandfather's pool and was so proud of these routines and told my dad that I wanted to be a water ballerina and then he burst my bubble and let me know that that was not a career. Um, but uh, the, then the next career after that was a teacher, which is actually what I went to school for. And as both Asha and Kelly mentioned, um, I ended up falling into banking and out of the necessity of being a single mom staying in banking and I do not regret it and absolutely love what I do, so yeah. I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> this is for Miss Inoue Perez. Who are your life influencers or heroes and why? You know, I have the longest list of people that I've surrounded myself with, but um, I'm going to ask, how many people here know who John Wooden is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of, unfortunately, not everyone in this generation does, but he, the most successful men's basketball coach and, uh, and at UCLA, and I had the great honor to be able to actually meet him. We used to go to his house, his living room, and he would uh, tell stories, he can read poetry, but when I became a head coach, he was the first person to call me and congratulate me, and I asked him a very simple question. Here I had been a part of UCLA my whole life, won championships, all of that, and I asked him, what am I going to need to do to be able to sustain this, because it was a little overwhelming now being the head coach, and he simply shared, Kelly, the championships, the history, it's as old as dirt, that was yesterday. You have no control, really, over what's going to happen next, so you got to focus on being great, today. And at the moment, I couldn't really grasp it. I was like, coach, how is that going to help me right now, right? <laughs> but in the bigger picture, a big part of my foundation and how I go about literally inspiring and living my world is truly understand you can only live in one time zone, in my version. You cannot live in the past. You cannot live in the future at the same time. So being able to be present and be where your feet are is something that I really learned from Coach Whitten, and I am so grateful. Um, that he got to be a part of influencing my world, and I live his words every day. The technology industry is constantly changing. Ms. Kleino, what helps keep your organization on the cutting edge? Uh, so that's a cool question. Uh, so I, I work for a company called Massimo, and it's a 30 plus year old company, um, but it's neat because it was founded so long ago, but is actually pretty young in the employees that work there. And just from what I've seen so far, the people that come in and out, I mean, we get to work with like old technology and just continue to build on that. And everyone's trying to find a way to help people and monitor things at home. And um, I don't know, I think the digital world is just kind of taking over everything. And thankfully, medical devices are one of those. So. Ms. Acharya, what first got you interested in career and how did you know it was right for you? 
Uh, first of all, great question. Thank you. I never knew it was right for me, even till today. <laughs> I'm, still <laughs> I'm still discovering it. And I think um, I always believed uh, that if you have a challenge in your life and you want to overcome it, you have to do it anyway, and you will find a way. You will have that willpower given to you by your relatives, by your friend, by your life partner, where you think where you are going and it's the right career for you. I, th I think even now I'm learning and I want to learn more, but being a physical therapist, I think it's fulfilling most of my goals and it's fulfilling most of my dreams and I want to do it more. Thank you. Ms. Nguyen, what obstacles or adversities did you face and how did you overcome those challenges? So I think one of the common themes that we're hearing is that you don't know what your career is going to be, and I'm just speaking for those high school students or junior high school students. And I think when obstacles or adversity happens, it helps you to reevaluate and change direction. And I'll share a story real briefly I'll try to do it real briefly, um, but I'm sitting next to Cindy, so she might rub on me. <laughs> so when I was working at Coca-Cola, I was a national retail um, sales director, and my responsibility was to manage large accounts. Uh, my annual business plan was about 600 million, and I was able to travel quite a bit. I travel globally to support my customers. And during a business trip, after a week of meeting with you know, the 30 managers, the day before I was to fly back home, I got into a car accident, which made me paralyzed from the neck down. I suffered from spinal cord injury. And all of a sudden, I couldn't walk. And I had to go through eight hours of surgery to fuse my spine back, and I literally had to learn how to walk again. And earlier, Kelly talked about when you face you know, adversity, that's when you know who you are, you know, how you react. That was a beautiful message, Kelly. And at that time, I realized I have two daughters at home and I had to get home to see them. And the neurosurgeon said it would take me three years to fully recover and three months to stabilize. And I just looked at him and I said, no way, that's, that's just not gonna happen. So I decided that I'm gonna work every muscle that I could move in my body. So for eight, nine, 10 hours a day, every waking moment that I had, I was doing, you know, they would tell me to do 10 stomach crunches, I would do 100. You know, lift my legs up, I would do, you know, for 20 times and I would do 200. And I would just work like a maniac, night and day. So the three months that they said, in three weeks, I was stable enough to fly home. In two months, I hiked two miles on our vacation and in Three months, I went back to work and finished my major multi-million dollar project and went back to work. And then two years later, I um, left and moved on from my job. And I decided to pursue what I'm passionate about, which is starting up live ops, learning labs. And I didn't realize that I had that in me, but because I had to deal with that adversity, it caused me to dig deep and figure out what I needed to do, and I did. Starting with Ms. Kleinow, what's one thing that inspires you personally? <laughs> um, 
he's in the audience. Uh, one thing that inspires me personally is uh, very much my family. Wow, thanks, Dad. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> Obviously, we're very close-knit, uh, but no, I, I grew up in a family who's always been so supportive of everything, and like I said, when growing up, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was all over the place, but I was always one that like built things and did puzzles and uh, like tomboy personality, whatever, and um, which led me eventually into engineering in my career, and I'm super grateful for it, um, and I just couldn't imagine it like any other way, and I know that I could not do this without them, so. Ladies, this is a speed round question, so Miss Nunn. So I, I mentioned earlier that I support 630 doctors and 4,000 employees that all deliver health care, but I am not a health care or a clinical person. Um, but what I do makes what they do possible. So when I see a nurse or a doctor or a medical assistant helping a patient, I feel personally connected to that interaction and that inspires me every day. Um, I am super easily inspired. So books, podcasts, poems, quotes, you name it, I'm inspired easily, but I think Bottom line, positive energy and belief. If I'm around people that believe we can, woo, I'll, I can't wait to bust through that wall. So belief inspires me. I, when I was asked this question when I was younger, I always thought I'd give a really smart answer and I'd say, I'm inspired by me 10 years in the future. And I just thought like that was such a smart answer. I inspire myself in the future, but um, <laughs> If I were to think about that now, I think I'm probably most inspired by my past self when I was at my very, very, very lowest points. Um, <clears throat> you know, obviously there's so many great leaders that we have and, you know, amazing. I love podcasts and self-help books and all of that. But I think something that I'm hearing so much amongst this panel is just the amount of adversity that we can all face. And when you can look back at a time in your life and you used to think, you know, I just feel so awful and so miserable and I don't know how I'm going to get out of this and it feels like there's no light at the end of the tunnel. But there is, there always is. If you just keep pushing, if you find another way, if you just keep going. Um, a high school teacher that I'll never forget, Dr. Spring, um, I was having just a lot of anxiety at that time and she told me, um, just wake up every day and put one foot in front of the other. Just, just keep walking, just keep going. Um, and I look back on that time and I just think back to my younger self who had no idea how good life could get. Um, and that's what inspires me to keep going. Okay, uh, coming from a background which is um, very, very torturous, I think. <laughs> uh, coming from India with, uh, with a long, long journey starting from 2013 where it's, it was only me and my husband and nobody else to support to, to even tell us that, okay, are we doing this wrong? Are we doing this right? And making your own path just by believing in yourself and just having that confidence. And I think that's the only thing I think I, I, it inspires me the most where I constantly uh, have to just believe in myself and keep pushing my boundaries. So for me, the first thing that came to mind was people and small wins. And I think it's, it's, that goes hand in hand together for me, both in my personal life and in my work life. So if my daughter, who's 20 years old, nailed an interview, that's a small win in her life, but a huge win in mine in terms of being inspired by how anxious she was and the anxiety she was struggling with before she went to that interview. And then similarly, when I 
you know, watch somebody close their first big deal as a new sales consultant or, you know, even somebody who struggled with public speaking who got up in front of my team and was able to do a presentation, watching those small wins in people really motivate me. I mean, the, even the wins I'm hearing at this table, all these women inspire me. So I think I'm um, really just uh, the small successes and the small wins throughout the day that add up to big ones are what inspires me. For me, it's, I, I try to take that one piece of a different person and um, help that, the inspiration that they give me for their performance. I like people that do things and don't talk about them. Um, Greg Luganis, a uh, phenomenal athlete, super kind, inspired me. Nolan Ryan with his work ethic, phenomenally um, talented and worked at it every day. Um, my oldest daughter who struggled to read um, and got through it and became a phenomenal student. She's now clerking for a, a state Supreme Court um, judge. Um, you know, it's it's the things like that. So I like to pull inspiration from people that I've either met or I've come into contact with and that are doing impressive things and not talking about them so much. I think a lot right now, people um, talk a lot and they don't always show. So I like people that model qualities um, that I admire, and then I try to um, model that for my kids and for the kids that I coach. Um, primarily, I would say really funny people inspire me because they energize me. Like if I'm in a room with really funny people, I get, I get energized, I get kind of infected with um, wanting to just play at that level. And so that inspires me. Anybody who's being like athletes, artists, dancers, anyone who's living authentically that I feel like when I'm with them one-on-one, -on -one, they're not blowhards and they're not like, they're real and they're action people and they're not like, you know, some word I probably can't say up here. <laughs> Because I want, I feel like when I leave a conversation, I want someone to feel energized by me. And so if someone's got a positive attitude, like you said, if somebody is, um, you know, trying really hard to do something or following their passion or anything like that, that is really inspiring because they're just living a really full life. Um, and so it makes, it makes me want to do the same. So... I, you know what, can I, before, what? before Giselle goes, isn't positive energy contagious? Oh my God. 100%. Right? I agree with you. Thank you for saying that. Yes. I absolutely agree. In, in the learning lab, we call that the weather system. We all carry a weather system with us when we walk into a room. That's why we know whether somebody's in a good mood or a bad mood. And so that energy that you just talked about is infectious and we all are attracted to people who live an authentic life, who uplifts and elevates and empowers others. I have a, a short story that I want to share and that is about my third grade teacher. And this is a true story and for all the teachers that are out there who are doing your job every day, I mean, my my uh, most respect to you. So my third grade teacher, Judy Sadler, was the first person who took me and exposed me to the environment. We went on a trip to Anza Borrego, and, and of course, here's a Vietnamese kid, you know, who have never been outdoors, you know, sleeping in a tent. I saw the desert for the first time. I saw, um, a cactus and you know we went on hikes and explore the environment and it's those moments that put an imprint in my life that has shaped my love for the environment and that's one of the reasons why I love hiking and I love traveling and I'm on the board of Inside the Outdoors Foundation because I want to continue to spread the love for the environment to all the students that I connect with.
Miss Bhattacharya, how did you build confidence in your professional and personal life? It's hmm, a good question. I think that you build confidence just by doing. Uh, I could sit here and just say, okay, just be confident, be confident, just go up there and just do it. And there are some things that you can do in the short term to maybe spike up your confidence a little bit, but I think over time, confidence genuinely comes from experience and you have to start somewhere. And I was someone, especially when I was in high school, who was so fearful. I was so afraid of failing. I was so afraid of not knowing the answer to something. It would paralyze me. And a quote that I started to live by that has truly changed my life is that if you can't beat the fear, then do it scared. I love that quote because it's not focused on trying to change any intuitive emotion that you have. It's focused on acting and, you know, in opposition of what is holding you back. There's a lot of things in life that are really, really scary. But if you want to build that confidence, you just have to do it and sit and tolerate that uncomfortableness. But I promise with time and experience, that's how you genuinely gain confidence. And if I could add to that, Asha, I think you're so key there. And I think the other piece, too, is that if you wait till you're confident, you'll probably never do it. And you, you know, mentioned kind of the words that you quoted to yourself, right? And one of the things that I tend to coach people is if you feel anxious, like use that as excitement. Like you can, you can channel that as an excitement. And I'm sure you know, as you're working with a lot of neurology, you can literally change your mindset by telling yourself things about yourself. I am confident. I am strong. Um, gosh darn it, people like me if you know the Saturday Night Live story. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but, uh, I, but that's the other thing, too, is that you can literally change the way you view yourself and think about yourself yourself and your abilities by um, speaking those kind words to yourself, by utilizing the energy inside of you that may be nervousness or anxiousness and turning that into, no, I'm just excited to get out there on stage or I'm excited to go make that deal or whatever it might be. So it's awesome. If I could just add to that, because I love what you're saying. I think confidence is like a muscle, right? If you want to be a softball player, go out there and throw the ball. Right? A basketball player, go there and out shoot some hoops. And if you want to be an engineer, learn math and science, right? So depending on what you're interested in and depending on what you love to do, just go out there and take action, like what my friend just said there. And, and, and I also think confidence has so much to do with practice. When I was working in corporate, I was so afraid to speak up. And I remember standing in front of this big meeting with 300 managers coming in. I'm supposed to lead this meeting and speak, and my knees would not stop shaking. It was so frightening, and it just took time and practice. And I think when you t make the effort to go out there and get uncomfortable, uh, like Kelly said, then that confidence develops. Yeah, and just one more add to that. So I, my, I, the colleague that I work with closely, that's my closest peer, he used to um, coach Kobe Bryant's camps um, for kids. And so he did that um, during the summer. And, and so Kobe would sometimes come visit the camp, visit the kids. It was his Mamba um, camp uh, uh, nonprofit. So um, he told us the story once where Kobe had just lost to the Celtics. Um, some of you might remember the year. I don't remember the year, but he, they had just lost the Celtics. And he came and he told my um, peer, bring me two of your coaches of the camp to come practice with me. Everybody was all excited. He pulled two of his best players, one of them from UCLA, um, two of his best coaches and had, said, hey, you're going to practice with Kobe tonight. Um, so they went out for an hour and a half, and then, you know, he follows up with them later, and they, how was it with Kobe? Like, how did it go? And they said, it's kind of boring. We practiced the same damn shot over and over and over again for an hour and a half. And going back to, yeah, you build that muscle, you build that practice, and that's how the greatest of all time is able to do that. Okay. Miss Nunn, what are your experiences with gender disparity and how did you work through it? So first I'm going to say that we are still working through it um, and we have a long way to go. But uh, especially in my field, um, gender disparity shows itself um, more often than you'd think. How many of you 
have met somebody who works in a hospital that is a woman, and you ask them, are you a nurse? I've been asked that probably a hundred times. It's a, um, it's just an assumption that people make about a gender. <clears throat> I've also had to point out to other physicians that the female physicians are often called by their first name but the males are called by doctor. What do we do? We point it out. We educate each other, and we call it out. Not in an offensive or confrontational way, but in a factual way, so that we learn from each other. I, can I add to that question? Um, I just wanted to say, when I was first starting out, I was usually the only woman writer in the writer's room. Sometimes there was two, but mostly it was like me and nine guys. And um, oftentimes mm, there would be a conversation where like I'd be going after a job and my agent would call me and say, they already have their woman. Um, and uh, so it was really, really hard. I mean, it was really hard even up to when Me Too started, because the game, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't so much the actual sexual harassment per se, you know what I mean? It wasn't an actual physical thing. It had to do with how, how you weren't allowed to make your livelihood the way that the men were making their livelihood. And I'm the primary breadwinner in my family, so, but I spent so much time trying to just be what they liked so that I could just keep working because if I wasn't working, it's better, but it's not really better. I mean, there's more women on staff and there's more opportunity in some ways, uh, but in other ways, like you're saying, it's just, um, it, it keeps evolving and the goalpost keeps moving because I know like older actresses who, when the Me Too thing happened, they were really mad about it. And I remember too, when it happened, I was sad. I was happy that it was happening. I was sad that it didn't happen earlier and I was mad that I didn't get to take advantage of it. But in retrospect, I'm so happy that so many doors are opening that I stood on the shoulders of the women that went before me and I can't imagine how hard it was for them and that the women and girls that'll come after me are gonna have an easier time of it. But it takes a long time to wrap your head around the fact that, you know what I mean, you're getting stood on now. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's my time to hold them up as so opposed to, you know. Can I add to that a little bit? And Yes, please. I, I, I want to tell you a little story. Um, so in my responsibilities, I sign physician offer letters. So if, if they're getting a job with us, um, the medical director signs and I sign. And I'd say probably over the last two years, um, I have felt more empowered to speak up when I see a disparity. And without using any names, we recently hired two surgeons, one male, one female. And the first offer came across my desk, and I signed it. It was for the male. And the second offer came across my desk, and it was for the female. And it was $125,000 less. And I got up and I walked into the medical director's office and I said, what's up? And it turns out that the female had asked for that much. And 
I wouldn't stand for that. I think the message I want to convey is that women don't always advocate for themselves. So sometimes we have to do it for each other. Beth, I love that you shared that. And that's what we need to do more of, supporting each other, showing up. And that's how we handle the disparity. Miss Granger, how did you manage the pressure of being an elite athlete while in high school? Well, <laughs> it was a little different back then. I would tell you that the administration and the teachers were super supportive. So when I was gone for two weeks at a world championship in the middle of the school year, they made that possible. Uh, whereas if my kid had to go somewhere these days, it would take a whole committee of people if they had, you know, were off doing something. They make it very difficult. I understand the reasons for it but the schools and the administration made it easy for me to participate as a national, uh, on the national team when I was in high school. Um, also, the students were freaking hilarious. Um, we wore white pants in high school, and apparently I thought it was a good idea to wear underwear with goldfish on my butt, and it was on the front page of the LA Times sports section, and I came to school, and all of the lockers when I walked in they got up early enough <laughs> and wallpapered the entire entrance in, um, yeah, my rear end with goldfish. So, I mean, I think that's how I managed it, right? I mean, I, I had a, there was a supportive school system. Um, my, my, um, my sisters were in the schools. I had a good group of friends and there was just a lot of really funny people. Um, coach Yo, who I guess just retired, was my volleyball coach in high school. He would let me um, be late to volleyball practice so I could pitch, and the baseball coach would let one of the baseball guys catch me dur during that 45-minute time period. So um, it, it made it possible, um, and, and I guess the pressure, it's different now. You know, nobody knows what you're doing. Like back then, they didn't know. They just knew I wasn't at school. They didn't know we were trying to win, you know, some tournament on the other side of the world. So I think the pressure on athletes is a lot different than it was back in the 80s because, you know, I could come and go and they knew where I was missing, but most, most people didn't really care other than, you know, when things would come up sometimes. So um, it was a lot, a lot different, I think, um, for me as an athlete in high school, um, whereas I think it's a lot more difficult um, now. But I, I would just say that the support from um, the students and my family and the school, um, you know, made it made it doable. I didn't, it, it just was my normal, so. And this is our final question, and it is a speed round question. So starting with Miss Inoue Perez, if you could have coffee with anyone from the past or the present, who would you pick and why? Um, you know, been asked that question, I had so many thoughts. I mean, I was gonna say Bruno Mars, but just kidding. Um, <laughs> I would absolutely pick Oprah Winfrey. And I believe Oprah Winfrey is, she has the best job of being able to influence, inspire, make, make a difference, impact lives. Like I love just hearing how she, she literally makes a difference and she makes wishes come true and she makes people cry, she makes people laugh, she entertains. I would love to be able to have an opportunity to go to coffee with Oprah. I would choose a celebrity as well. I would do Taylor Swift because, <laughs> yes, Taylor Swift fans. Um, I, you know, she's been my favorite artist, but I think more importantly, she's a very powerful storyteller. Um, and stories connect all of us. Stories are what make us share emotions and make us open up. And um, the power to connect with somebody uh, through story, through being vulnerable, through opening up is really, really powerful. So I'd love to sit down and, and talk with her about her experience. And I think she's a very successful woman in the industry who's been through a lot of the things that we're talking about, adversity. Um, maybe her problems might be a little bit different than ours, but she, you know, she's still got it. And I think she's done a very good job handling that. Uh, 
I would like to have um, a cup of coffee with my husband who's sitting right there and <laughs> for being just my best friend for past 20 years and um, definitely having this journey together from India to US and settling down and having a life here, it's not easy. And being that pillar of strength for me with my every, I mean, we have our lows and highs and being there, that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Hashtag relationship goals right there. It's like, <laughs> whoa, uh, <laughs> good answer. Um, so for me, I, the, a per, one person that comes to mind, and, and really, I love to hear an inspiring story, but um, Yoga with Adrienne, if you ever YouTube yoga, like she's one of the first people that comes up, and she had a vision um, when she first started teaching yoga that she wanted to get yoga into, that let everybody know that they can do yoga. So yoga is my second passion beyond um, what I do in my day job and my children. Um, and so I think she was somebody who took a love and a passion that she had and turned it into something that she could share with the world in a very tangible way. Um, now she She's been on Good Morning America, and you know I read her newsletter every week, and I think that um, hearing her story of kind of how um, she became an entrepreneur with her passion in a way that um, you know is is so accessible to the world and helps in, with mental health and well-being, uh, I'd love to hear her story. Um, my parents passed away in 2018, so I would like to have coffee with my dad, who taught me how to pitch and my mom who taught me how to bake and be a good mom. Um, I would like to uh, have coffee with William Goldman. A lot of you might not know him. He's an old screenwriter, but I guess you might know from Princess Bride, but he's written some of the most amazing movies from the 70s, and he's just a amazing storyteller. And the other person I was going to say was Eleanor Roosevelt, because I feel like service is a really important part of our existence, and I think that she could help me um, under, you know, learn how to do that better. And I want to say one other thing before we wrap. To the late, to the girl, young girls, I just want to say, assume that people want you there when you're somewhere, as opposed to thinking that they're doing you a big favor. Like, deal yourself in. Um, it's just a good place to start. That's all. Wow, so many names came through my mind. Brene Brown, Trevor Noah, Greta Thunberg, Nelson Mandela. But the person that I'm going to talk about, given the short time that we have, is Nicole Mann. I'm not sure if you heard in the news, but she's the first Native American woman to go into space on SpaceX Dragon spacecraft today. And this is what she said. She said, never discount yourself. If you, go, if you don't go after a dream or a goal, and if you don't try, you're never going to make it. So she said, pursue the topics in school. Ask for help. Meet people that have done that job that you want to learn more about. And the person that I would have coffee with is my daughter. I would drink the coffee, she'll probably drink, you know, the Fresca or something, but I would love to hear what goes on in her life and just to keep our relationship close and connected. That's who I would choose. So mine would actually be Conan O'Brien, um, and <laughs> my generation kind of knows him from his show, Conan, and maybe his podcast, now if you listen to that, but just watching his show, listening to his podcast, knowing his story of studying history at Harvard to work on the Harvard Lampoon, which is like a comedy writing, um, getting into the Simpsons, SNL, late night show, and then Conan, now the podcast, and struggling with mental health, like, throughout all that, and just his willingness to talk to so many people and have his worldwide show where he's literally traveling, just learning all the cultures, I think he's just, through his successes, is a very well-rounded person, and I think he'd be funny to listen to, obviously, but also really interesting in that way. So 
So like everybody else, this is a really tough question for me, and I can't narrow it down to one. I have to give you two. One is Julia Child, because her book drives me crazy. <laughs> I love to cook from it, and it's a lot of fun. But I think if I had to choose, it would be Abby Wamba, um, number one soccer player in the world, male or female. And But the reason that I would pick her is because her book, Wolfpack, which if you haven't read it, it's about that thick. It'll take you about 45 minutes. It changed my life, truly. And if you don't read, listen to her speech, her commencement speech to the women of Barnard. It is changing me every day as a leader. Thank you, panelists. At this time, we would like to welcome Director of High Schools, Gina Aguilar, to the stage. Thank you, and wow, what a great evening, everybody. The vision of PYLUSD states that we are a dynamic learning community that prepares each and every student for success now and in the future. Our student moderators tonight demonstrated poise, professionalism, and leadership. Thank you for showing my young daughter, Reese, who's in the audience tonight, what she can aspire to do as a high school student. If our students here this evening are any indication of the quality of all of our outstanding PYLUSD students, our future is in great hands. I'm certain we can expect to see many of them on this stage as panelists someday, just as we've seen some of our alumni up here today. Can we give a round of applause for all of our student moderators this evening? I'm gonna go off script for one second. They always get mad at me when I do this, but as we get close to closing out the event tonight, I'd like to give thanks one more time to our committee members who put their hearts into making this event happen. Please stand again for recognition, Brianne Galati, Beth Scott, Amy Madrigal, and Sue Sawyer. To our students and parents here tonight, if you would like to see in person all our high schools have to offer, each of our comprehensive high schools hosts an annual showcase event on their campus. Valencia will highlight their programs on Wednesday, November 9th at 6 p.m. El Dorado's event is on Thursday, December 1st at 6 p.m. Your Belinda will feature their programs on Wednesday, December 7th at 6 p.m. And rounding out the four schools on Wednesday, December 14th, also at 6 p.m., Esperanza High School will open their doors to visitors. I'd now like to turn it back over to Beth Scott for some closing remarks. Yeah. Thank you, panelists, and we appreciate you sharing your stories and insights with our audience this evening. I invite you at this time to go ahead and exit the stage. You will have the opportunity in just a few minutes when we conclude our program to meet with them, greet with them, and potentially take pictures. Our desire is to influence each and every PYL student to reach their full potential, exploring possibilities for their futures through the exciting hands-on CTE programs offered. Our career link and academy pathways will challenge you, allow you the chance to explore, and prepare you for what the future holds and the talents of our amazing Pathway students are very much on display this evening, from the printed program, to the live stream broadcast, to the snacks you'll be served when you leave, our CTE Pathway students are actively involved in the production of this event. And our hope is for every young person to identify their purpose, that through our programs and pathways, they discover where their skills and passions intersect with a well-paying career. Success is not final, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that counts. Everyone, please rise for the retiring of our colors.
Thank you. Please be seated. This evening was made possible through a dedicated team of teachers, students, as well as the generous donations of our sponsors, the Reach Foundation and UC, USA Softball of Southern California. I want to give a quick shout out to Chef Martinez and his Culinary Pathway students. Thank you to Rod Bowes, Sue Sawyer, and Mark Switzer and their tech crew and our, their students who are ser serving as our tech crew for the evening. Thank you to Marie Sharan and her students for creating our program as well as the graphics. Thank you to Reed Peterson and Kelly Fritz for creating and doing d print design for us. And thank you to our wonderful student moder moderators. I want to give them a hand. <laughs> And now, and now our drawing. Winners were selected using the attendance registration, and the first winner is Michael Stewart from Esperanza High School. Michael, are you in, are you here? And our second winner, I thought she was walking towards him. If he's here, I'm good. I'm moving on. All right. And our second winner is Katherine Dunham from Yorba Linda Middle School. It seems that student is, in fact, present. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and supporting Empowered. Have a great night, everyone, and please join us in the lobby. Thank you.